Hey, Prof. Hi, Helga. Can I just try and share my screen and see if it works? Better no, please, this please do. Please do. I've allowed you to do that. Thanks. Looks like ESCOM is be, be, being kind to us. Yeah, my load shedding here was not load shedding related. It's a different issue. Okay. That's fine. I can. Uh, okay. Prof. Fandikirk is also joining. Okay. I want to see. There we go. Hello, Martin. Hello, Martin. He's still connecting. He's still connecting, yes. <clears throat> Hello, Martin. Sorry, Martin, you need to unmute yourself. I'll try again. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, okay. That, that's right. perfect. That's perfect. Uh, hi, greetings, Martin, from East London. No, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to join you, guys. No, no, uh, I will we'll just wait for a few minutes. People are just joining, yeah. and then, then I will okay. introduce you formally. But... Uh, okay. Colin sends his greetings and apologies. He can't be with us today. Um, yeah, he, yeah he's no, you must send my, my regards as well. I will do that. I will do that. Actually, he's closer to you than to us now. He's in Kalakhadi. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, that's great. <laughs> yes. Is he, still, is he still operating or not really? No, no, he's still working hard. Oh, hard. Okay, yeah. that's good news. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Still, he is uh, no longer doing sessions for our department, but uh, okay. he still is running um, full-time private practice, and he is doing um, uh, university work as well. He is associate dean for the Faculty of Health Sciences of our Walter Susulu University in East London. Really? Yeah. Yes. That's, that's wonderful. Yes. And no. his health is still his health is still good and so on. He doesn't oh, have health problems. Martin, he's uh, four to five times stronger than me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he still cycles. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, no, he's he's and, good. He's good. Yeah. And how's his, how's the weather with you guys? Um, spring has arrived nicely. <laughs> Okay. which we are grateful but uh, the, we're still waiting for rain uh, okay the, the same with us it's it's quite warm these days yes sort of, uh, the spring is here but we're still waiting for for, for, for showers or for rain so uh, okay okay us. yeah i i see uh, dr marie kirsten is also joining i'm i'm very happy well okay great yes yeah, yeah. Uh, Hello, good afternoon, uh, Mary. Uh, good afternoon. I just have to unmute myself to greet. Yes, Thank no, you. wonderful. Wonderful. Nice to have you. Thank you very much. Martin, is your knee still in East London? Yeah, she's still there. Uh, okay. I think working in casualties. Oh, she's working and in casualty. Yeah, uh, my son, uh, he did his uh, Zuma year with three military hospital. <laughs> uh, yeah, and now he decided to join the army there. So, uh, which is nice because, you know, they have uh, lots of off time and things like that. Okay. And he's doing a lot of sport uh, these days. Okay. Um, but they stay. Yeah, they sent him with, uh, down there to East London. He was there last week in East London. 
Really? And this week they're in, in uh, Umtata. Oh, yes. You know, yes. Is, uh, he, is, and, is he also a medical doctor? Yeah. He's oh, in, uh, okay. I think he's going to Queenstown at some stage. Uh, no, so, uh, yeah. No, we knew that there was an SNDF team which came and they were spending one week, uh, I think, in, in East London, yeah. Umtata and Port Elizabeth. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's just maybe to, to show that the, the Defence Force is also doing something, you know. Yes. So I, don't, I don't think there's much work for them to, to be done. <laughs> no, uh, no, no. We knew so he's that. a little bit... So he's a little bit frustrated, but maybe yes. it's, a, it's a good thing for him to see that the army isn't <laughs> maybe the answer, <laughs> you know. And, and what level is he, Martin? Is he doing internship or community service? What is he doing? No, he did his community service last year. Oh, okay. And he's, he stayed on at three more at the uh, oh. internal medicine department. Okay, and, okay. Uh, he wants to do the, the diploma early next year, so he w also wants to sort of uh, do internal medicine at some stage. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, he saw how his dad worked and everything, so I think he, <laughs> he decided <laughs> surgery is not for him. You know? <laughs> he's, he's absolutely not interested in any in surgical <laughs> things. So. <laughs> no, uh, but it... I, I even took him to an IPEG meeting in London. Two yes. or three years ago, and even that didn't, uh, you know, impress <laughs> him much. So, <laughs> yeah, so that's the story. No, but the, but that's good actually. There will be a different perspective uh, in medicine in your family. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. You know, so. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, and I think it's a good thing, you know. Uh, no, I'm absolutely. Not, uh, sad what the, the, you No, know, I like, didn't know. I didn't know he was here, otherwise I would have made a point to say hello to him at least. Yeah, the thing is, you know, they so they go with a bus in and the uh, even the they stayed at the hotels, which is nice, but they have to sit in uh, menus and you know they have to go as a group and and you know and yes, go for yes. supper or everything. So he's quite restricted. No, no, I think yeah, I think they were uh, almost like moving as a group, if I'm correct. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Sort so of he's in not a bubble. To, yeah, he's not allowed to do his own thing. Yes, and, yes. And uh, yeah. he's doing a lot of uh, running and so on, but in, he said it's too dangerous in Umtat down um, those areas. Yes, so, yes, yes, yes. He's just yes. Uh, going to the gym and so on. Yes, yes. Um, Martin, I think uh, most of the people yeah, okay. are here. So, so I just introduce you formally uh, and then we will start the talk in a minute. Um, yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. It's really uh, my my great pleasure and privilege uh, to welcome you all, but especially to welcome Professor Martin Fannikirk, who is a professor of pediatric surgery at University of Pretoria. And um, he uh, mainly works at, uh, if I'm correct, Martin can correct me, at Kloof Medical Clinic in Pretoria. And I yeah. know him for a very long time, almost uh, 20 plus years. And he is one of the most experienced laparoscopic and uh, thoracoscopic pediatric surgeon in the country. And he may tell us the exact numbers, but I'm sure he has done over, over 1,000 laparoscopic Nissen fundoplication. And, um, and it is absolute pleasure that with this uh, pandemic, with the Zoom platform, we are able to get uh, his, uh, his advice, his opinion, and he will share his, his, um, uh, his ideas about uh, this common problem we face with. And I also welcome uh, Dr. Mary Kirsten. I also know Dr. Kirsten for a very long time, and she has been a permanent member of the Department of Pediatric Surgery at Steve Biko Hospital, and, uh, and welcome Dr. Kirsten. Uh, today, uh, our registrar, Dr. Helga Nahaus, is going to present about gastroesophageal reflux disease. She has been mentored by our consultant, Dr. Selo Machaya, who is um, our consultant uh, with us, one of our four full-time consultants. With uh, he has special interest in uh, GI surgery and hepatobiliary surgery. So, without further introduction, 
Um, I'll invite Dr. in the house uh, to, to start her talk. Helga, please go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, my topic today is gastroesophageal reflux disease in children. Um, and due to time constraints, we'll fly over some topics or some aspects of it a bit faster and we'll go into more detail on some other aspects. Um, first, a few definitions, just so that we are all on the same page. Um, gastroesophageal reflux is considered the passage of gastric content into the esophagus. Gastroesophageal reflux disease, the part we are talking about, is reflux that has pathological consequences like esophagitis or nutritional compromise where the child has failure to thrive or respiratory complications where they aspirate feeds um, or have recurrent lower respiratory tract infections. Then regurgitation is an effortless reflux up into the oropharynx or above, um, considered also obvious gastroesophageal reflux, or some people call it spitting up. And then vomiting is a forceful expulsion engaging abdominal and respiratory muscles of reflux aid out of the mouth. Um, often the two, regurgitation and vomiting, are distinguished whether if the regurgitate is coming up and just running out the mouth or whether it's going forceful against the wall opposite the child. Just to keep in mind these different things when we see these children and try and figure out what is going on. Coming to some mechanisms that prevent reflux, these are important to know when we investigate these children and especially when we start offering surgical management for them. Um, one of the important factors is the esophagus and esophageal clearance. How fast can it move reflexate that's gone up back into the stomach? One very important component is the lower esophageal sphincter. Its um, tone is very important, especially in the small children. They have a decreased tone of the lower esophageal sphincter, which is why they often. Um, have reflex. Also the position of it is very important. If the low esophageal sphincter is below the diaphragm, it prevents reflux much better, which comes to the next point. The length of intra-abdominal esophagus is important. In adults it's considered three to four centimeters is adequate. In children I couldn't find any specific numbers. Then one that we are very concerned about in our surgery is the angle of his. We want an acute angle of his so that it can, as the fundus fills up, close the esophagus where it inserts into the um, stomach. And then the crew of the diaphragm are also important as they help the um, esophagus close and prevent reflux. We'll come back to these when we come back to the surgery. Now for investigations, for the majority of children is often not needed. Usually history and exa um, clinical examinations are the only two that are needed. And for the majority of patients, that's all we need to make a diagnosis and to start management, whether it's to reassure patients, um, start medical management or surgical management. The only patients that really do need Diagnostic evaluations are those that um, have complex disease or we don't know exactly what's going on, might be something else that's wrong, or we're trying to rule out other problems that can be causing something that looks similar to reflux. The current gold standard is the multi-channel intraluminal impedance study, which through multiple channels measures a difference in charge or in resistance. Um, and can therefore measure anything that goes, whether it's gas, liquids, or solids, goes up or down, and how far it goes and where it goes, and this gets traced over 24 hours. The precursor to this had been just a esophageal pH study, which only measures acid reflux and doesn't seem to be that appropriate in children as they seem to have more alkaline reflux. However, the 
best is to combine these two in a single device and measure over 24 hours how much reflux do they have, what is the duration of um, reflux state in the esophagus, how long does it take to clear. It can also distinguish between swallowing and reflux and like I said between gas, liquids and solids. However, we don't have this available at our institution. Coming to the next one, which we do have available, is what we can um, call a contrast swallow. Um, can also be a swallow and follow through. It does not accurately re reflect the frequency or, the, or diagnose gastroesophageal reflux disease. If we don't see it on these studies, doesn't mean that there is no reflux, as it gives only one point in time where we can see what's going on. But it is quite important to rule out any other problems, whether there's malrotation, whether there's the antral web, annular pancreas, um, achalasia, or even strictures. And sometimes it can even show us a high hernia. For that, it's quite useful. In the neurologically impaired children, we also use it to assess the ability for them to swallow because they don't just require um, a fund application for their reflux, but they often require gastrostomies as well. But in, so like I said, it's not the most accurate study to be done. And the current recommendation is actually that it doesn't really make much of a difference in the majority of patients, unless we expect another problem. In a study done in 20. 10, it showed that only 4.2% of patients doing a contrast swallow made any difference to their operative management. However, when they did a survey in 2011, 80% of pediatric surgeons said that they require pre-op um, contrast swallow to see what's going on. So it might not be the most accurate, but it's definitely the most commonly done. Endoscopic studies are also very important because we can check for the consequences of pathological reflux or esophagitis. We can see strictures and we can take biopsies and possibly distinguish between reflux esophagitis or esophagitis secondary to other issues. Um, yeah, and we can also see anatomical problems like a hiatus hernia. Just to mention, so because we had spoken about it previously, eosinophilic esophagitis is a chronic immune mediated disorder, uh, which is different to um, reflux. It can look similarly on endoscopy, but it does not show the same on biopsy and it gets treated differently. It's therefore important to distinguish um, that from reflux esophagitis. Um, Again, we don't do this study very often, but the North American Society of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition um, consider endoscopy the most sensitive study to evaluate gastroesophageal reflux disease. And their current recommendations and indications are to do endoscopic studies when we fail medical management, if there's weight loss in the child, fecal cold blood, um, recurrent pneumonias, or hematemesis. We only do it on selected patients um, and not that commonly. Then the milk scan, which was described in Red Cross, we can't do it, but we still need to know about it. However, it's not done much internationally anymore. It's a study where we mix technetium 99 with milk and let the child drink that. And to see what happens, where's the swallow, uh, where is it going? Um, it's the most accurate study to see whether there's any aspiration, as you can see on the picture. However, it's not done very commonly at all. Then medical management, well, the first step of it is actually more lifestyle changes, like in adults as well. Um, 
first to avoid tobacco smoke exposure, which has shown to lower the esophageal sphincter pressure and improves um, the children with symptomatic esophageal reflux disease quite significantly if the parents avoid smoking in their presence or stop smoking altogether. The next one is to avoid overfeeding, so rather smaller and more frequent feeds. Keep the children upright after feeds um, for about 30 to 35 minutes. Semi-supine or in a propped up position can make it worse because it um, can raise inter-abdominal pressure which makes the reflexing worse. So these children should rather be kept upright, hold upright by the mom, than be propped up in a um, baby carrier. They still recommend that the children should sleep supine because um, sudden infant death syndrome, um, yeah, syndrome should, um, is considered to be more common in a prone position. Another recommendation is to thicken feeds. There's um, some debate how effective that is, but it seems to work at least for some patients and is worth trying. And then avoidance of cow milk and soy protein, if all of the above doesn't work before we start off going on to other avenues, because about 40% of patients with suspected gastroesophageal reflux disease actually have intolerance to cow milk and soy protein and need to get very hydrolyzed milk products. Or if they're breastfed, mom must try and avoid all of these products. And that significantly improves their symptoms. Coming to pharmacotherapy, um, it's for majority of children not indicated, especially in infants as it's uncomplicated reflux and usually improves um, with just um, lifestyle changes. And if they do become irritable, some studies have shown that it doesn't improve their irritability of the child. However, if a gastroesophageal reflux disease is symptomatic, we usually give PPIs to try and improve their symptoms. It doesn't improve the reflexing, but it improves some of the symptoms as less gastric acid is secreted and refluxed. Um, the indications currently are if with mild esophagitis on endoscopy, we give a two-week trial of PPIs and see what happens after that. Um, or when lifestyle changes have fa failed, or if they have moderate to severe esophagitis, they then should get PPIs for three to six months. PPIs are currently the recommended drug as H2 or histamine 2 blockers are not as good in children. Um, they develop tolerance and might need increased doses and only has a short term effect. And antacids and prokinetics are not at all indicated in children. Problems with PPIs that we just need to keep in mind if we put children on long-term PPIs for various reasons is that it can present with increased risk of diarrhea, pneumonia, because it eliminates the acid in the stomach, which is one of our barriers to infection, can cause vitamin B12 deficiency, iron deficiency, and possibly, which is still in debated, a higher risk for allergies. Coming to surgical management, which is where it gets interesting for us. Um, the indications for surgical management are few and only very few of the many patients that have reflux will ever end up with surgical management. However, the ones who have failed medical management will need surgical management. Also, the ones who have failure to thrive, often neurologically impaired children, especially those who need ingastrostomies. Um, who often also have reflux and will come back to neurologically impaired children in a bit. Um, children with reflux and respiratory complications, then children who have witnessed a, um, adverse life-threatening events, um, spells, like near death from aspirating 
refluxed food or severe pneumonias. Children with Barrett's esophagus, children who develop esophageal stricture secondary to reflux disease and symptomatic gastroesophageal reflux secondary to a hiatal hernia. All these will usually end up needing surgical management. The most commonly done operation for these children is laparoscopic fund duplication. It's advantages that it has small incisions with less pain post-op and less need for opioid analgesia and usually faster recovery. And it's even though laparoscopic surgery needs more skill from the operating surgeon, it's often easier to see what we are doing and to get into far up under the diaphragm to see where the esophagus and the stomach and the diaphragm when all these things come together. For our experience, it's been the same. The disadvantages um, in a 2016 study has shown that it has higher failure rate, which might be secondary to previous um, more dissection around the esophagus and the diaphragm, which is currently um, not advised anymore. So the aim of a laparoscopic Nissen fund application is to get a floppy tension-free wrap of the fundus around the distal esophagus. Um, to do the operation, we place our patient supine, often with the legs hanging off the table or in a frog leg position or in an older child in a lithotomy position. Um, this position has to be sometimes changed for the neurologically impaired children as they often have contractures, scoliosis already. Then the camera port is placed at the umbilicus with two working ports and one port for retracting the liver. First, the gastropathic ligament is taken down. Then the posterior window is dissected carefully between the esophagus and the crua. Um, staying closer to the crua as the vagal nerve runs along the posterior part of the esophagus. And at that point, you can see there's a decent length of intra-abdominal esophagus. Sometimes we need to take down the short gastrics to give the stomach better mobility and to access the posterior part of the esophagus easier. Um, it's generally recommended because it um, gives a better floppy wrap. Um, once that is done, we need to check how big the hiatal opening is between the crew and whether those need to be closed. They're usually closed with non-absorbable sutures. And then the pull, stomach is pulled posterior to the esophagus through the window that was created earlier. Um, we check for adequate, adequate space with the shoe shine maneuver. And like I said in the beginning, this must be tension free. Um, floppy wrap and once that is achieved the um, wrap is secured um, with usually two or three stitches one of these at least need to go through the esophagus to prevent migration of the wrap um, which is one of the complications seen the other two don't usually have to be secured and then we can uh, proceed with a gastrostomy depending on whether the child needs it or not. There are some alternatives to this operation. One is obviously our openness and fund application, which we sometimes do for our small children who already have aspiration pneumonias, who won't tolerate um, a pneumoperitoneum. Um, alternative wraps are uh, the toupee, which is here in number B. It's also a posterior wrap, but only 270 degree wrap, not a full 360 degree as the Nissan over here. Then the door wrap is an anterior 180 degree wrap. Um, and then the tall fund application is an anterior wrap 
depth of 270 degrees. Sorry. Um, sometimes our wraps fail and we have to do redo fund applications. However, they become more difficult as there are already more adhesions. And then esophageal gastric dissociations, just to show what this is all about. It's a um, technique described by very few surgeons in the world, has been done only a very few times, but is a rescue procedure if the other ones don't work. Um, and is often done, or is more commonly done in micro uh, stomachs and in neurologically impaired children. What it all involves is the stomach gets um, disconnected from the esophagus, a pyloplasty is done, and then um, distal jejunum is as a roux and wire procedure pulled up to the esophagus with this one connected further down again. Surprisingly, these children do very well with very little reflux um, and tend to do much better nutritionally after the operation is done. But again, it's done in very few patients in very few centers in the world. One was described in Cape Town for a micro stomach, which is where this picture is coming from. Then the neurologically impaired children are our most common patients that we do um, nissen fund duplications for. They generally have more problems with gastroesophageal reflux disease because they already have problems with initiating swallowing. They have motility disorders of their gut, which includes the esophagus. With their hyper um, increased tone and decreased tone, they often have very poor positioning. They often have recurrent seizures, which increases the risk or the times of um, refluxing and aspiration. They already have an even further decreased low esophageal sphincter tone, which makes them even more prone for reflux. And because of motility disorders, have delayed gastric emptying. Delim the dilemma with these children is that they are a largest group that need fund applications, but they also are highest risk for complications. So we really need to look after these children well before, before up, intra-op and post-op. So pre-op, we always need to do a chest X-ray and chest physio as far as possible to check for aspiration, sort out any uh, pneumonias, get physio to clear them their secretions. In our center, recent for the last few ones, we've had them admitted for two, three weeks pre-op, which gives us time for physio to teach mom, to teach positioning, to clear secretions. Um, it also gives us time to nutritionally rehab them as they often come with feeding problems, can't swallow properly, so they're very nutritionally behind. And we often place NG tubes for them first, feed them up better, and then they tolerate the operation much better. Very important, we should get seizures controlled as good as possible, sometimes not as completely eliminated. The reason this needs to be done properly is these children um, have increased risk for seizures post-op, and we've had a few who ended up in status epilepticus where we couldn't abort them at all and eventually demised. And as I said earlier, if the, um, consider a fund application at the time if a child is referred for a gastrostomy because they're not eating properly. Then intra-op, other than the usual things we do for all our patients, for the neurologically impaired one, we have to look after their positioning and pressure points much more carefully than the normal children as the they often have contractures already and scoliosis that need added padding or different positioning. And post-op, they are much higher risk for pneumonias. They can develop uncontrolled seizures, as I mentioned earlier. 
um, a lot of ours have done very well post-op if we looked after them very well pre-op and got them better before we took them to theatre. Complications for these procedures, not necessarily just for the neurologically impaired, but for all children. Intra-op is obviously hemorrhage, bowel perforation is um, colon and is very close up there. Pneumothorax, as we are working up by the diaphragm and injury to the vagus nerve. Surgical site infection is one of those that we can see post-op. Empyema, again, because we work up by the diaphragm. Esophageal strictures, what looks like esophageal strictures if the wrap is too tight. And then pneumonias. Longer term complications, or hiatal hernias if the wrap moves back up, breakdown of the wrap, um, slipped wrap, gas bloat syndrome, which is described more in adults, but they struggle to belch with the fund application, which might mean it's a bit too tight. Um, they have an inability to vomit because we don't want any reflex aid to come up. They might develop a slow eating habit as it takes time for food to pass through the lower esophageal sphincter where the wrap was done. And some have described dumping syndrome. Um, risk factors to develop these complications were studied also by the Cape Town Red Cross team. Surprisingly to me, they found that neurological impairment itself was not a risk factor for complications. However, these ones listed here is what they found. Um, cardiac problems, the younger the patients were, so children under three months were had a higher risk of complications than children who were older than 37 months. Children with esophageal atresia, esophageal strictures, and children who need gastrostomies, which often does include their neurologically impaired children. These children also need to be followed up carefully to see, to look for complications and to see whether our operation has worked well for them. Or, um, initially, parents and then later on children need to be educated on, on what was done and what can be expected, um, that they need to have soft diet for the first two weeks and can feel very bloated, but these Symptoms often improve. After two weeks, they can start solid feeds, um, which is not that much of a problem for neurologically impaired children. And then on repeat visits, we want to take good history on whether they have developed any dysphagia, bloating, or whether there's recurrent symptoms of gastroesophageal reflux disease. If there's any concerns, we need to investigate them for complications with um, contrast studies and endoscopy before starting any further medical treatment or suggest any further surgical treatment and once we know what's wrong we sort them out from there. So in conclusion reflux is a very common problem especially in infants they usually outgrow their problem though the majority of them don't need any investigations and not much more treatment other than lifestyle management. And it's important to know who are the ones that do need surgical intervention and to work them up well and look after them well so that they can do well because those are the ones who complicate the easiest. Thank you very much. Helga? That, that, was, that was a very good presentation. Uh, Professor Fandikirk will comment, but it is a big, vast topic. And um, we asked you to compress it in 25 to 30 minutes, and you have finished exactly in 30 minutes. So, so that is very good. Um, I think at this stage, I will invite Professor Fandikirk to, uh, to give his opinion, advice, starting from advice about presentation, but then uh, opinion and, and advice in general about reflux, fund application. So Martin, please. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. It was a very nice presentation. Can I ask the presenter if you uh, do a, a, a lab lesson in a child and you use a various needle for excess and the patient's blood pressure drop, drop what can be the causes when you, inst when you start the procedure? Do you know? Well, the, very good, yeah. Okay, go ahead, Elga. Okay. Um, the increased pressure from the pneumoperitoneum can mean decreased um, venous return, therefore decreased cardiac output, which can be the reason for the um, lower blood pressure. As you expand the intra-abdominal cavity, you also um, decrease the, or cause pressure onto the pericardia or yeah, pericardium, which can um, irritate the heart and cause hypotension. Or you have injured something that you shouldn't have and the child does bleeding, I guess, but the blood, big blood vessels are rather posterior and you shouldn't go that far deep. The thing is, if you if you do the access procedure with a various needle, there's always the possibility to to injure the big uh, blood vessels, the uh, aorta or the iliac vessels. So uh, w when you look with the scope, okay, you, you place your port, you look with the scope, and you uh, don't see any blood. What next? You don't see any free blood in the abdomen. If you I'll, I'll tell you what I what, okay. Oh yeah, just there's a lot of maybe there are a lot of other questions, but the thing is, uh, an auto injury or one of those injuries or a retroperitoneal injury, so you won't sometimes you won't see blood in the abdomen. Mm -hmm. It will, will be retroperitoneal in that area. So if you just look with the sequence, problem. The other thing that's de these days very much on the cards or uh, CO2 embolization mm -hmm. when you use a various needle. Steve Rottenberg uh, described 10 or 15 cases where uh, after placement of the, of the, uh, the various needle and CO2 inf infusion, then the blood pressure dropped uh, and so on. And that is because of CO2 uh, uh, embolization. And obviously, if you, if you start the thing, if you open, to start with your CO2, you must first empty your, your, uh, the pipes and everything of normal air because air is a much more dangerous thing. You, you need much less uh, air to cause that problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, can I just ask you the last question? At the end of the procedure, if your blood pressure drop, drop and, the, and your saturation drop, what, is the, what can be the problem? That you've caused a pneumothorax. Yeah, that's right. So not not even if you if you have enter the the pleural uh, cavity, sometimes the CO2 just seeps through. And the other thing is there are uh, congenital pleuroperitoneal canals or openings that can also uh, cause this problem. So it can happen in any laparoscopic uh, operation that CO2 goes to the and cause a capnothorax. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say about the uh, esophagogastric dissociation. Uh, I saw on that picture there was a pleuroplasty, but because that, uh, then you later said there was a micro stomach, mm. because normally you don't do a pleuroplasty. Mm. And the other thing is, most people, I think there's no place to do it as a primary procedure. Mm. Uh, most people will do it after three or so mm. failed uh, nascent fundiplications, uh, especially in neurologically impaired children. Mm. Mm. Uh, then you can maybe do that. Uh, the other option is then maybe a feeding urinostomy. And what also sometimes helps is to, if you do a gastrostomy, is to put a gastrostomy on, on this lesser curvature of the stomach. That helps a lot to prevent a reflux if reflux is your problem. Mm. Yeah, um, I'm just going to mention two things and then maybe somebody can, uh, can uh, ask questions. Yes, the yes. One is, if you have a baby with, if you have a baby with reflux, uh, then uh, the problem in more than ninety percent of cases is not a problem with the valve; it's a neurologically dysmotility, dysmotility problem, oropharynx, esophagus motility problem. 
that causes the problem. So it's almost never necessary to, to, give, uh, to give a PPI in small babies. So uh, what we do in those children, we, uh, you can do a contrast study just to exclude other reasons for uh, other reasons for reflux and then we scope most of these babies uh, in previous years we didn't do much uh, gastroscopies but these days for me that's one of the most important uh, special investigations to do gastroscopy to look out to look for uh, eosinophilic esophagitis to exclude other pathology. There are many other things that can, can also uh, influence the esophagus. And then what, what also is important, if you look in the textbook, you will see that there are about 20 things that can influence the stomach as well. well. So you can have uh, autoimmune problems and, and all those things affecting the stomach. So if you, if you do biopsies, you must do biopsies of the esophagus at least the distal esophagus, middle and proximal esophagus, one or two biopsies and biopsies of the stomach and duodenal biopsies. So that child uh, that we're talking about, we will, we'll, we will do a gastroscopy on that child. And then we will uh, uh, look for, uh, you know, allergies. So we might give the, the patient uh, protein, protein or uh, uh, so uh, uh, feeds, hydrolyzed protein feeds and things like that to exclude, exclude uh, allergies, milk allergy. But for the rest, uh, yeah, we put in a nasogastric tube and then see if we can feed the child. Uh, in most of the cases, the problem is in the stomach and you can feed the child for, with a nasogastric tube. Uh, that problem, uh, motility problem, usually goes away by four or five uh, months. So you can give the child a, a place a nasogastric tube. You can change the feeds, you know, make smaller feeds or even continuous feeds. And the child can even go home with a nasogastric tube. In, in smaller babies, less than three, three kilograms, it's seldom that the tube falls out. But for the rest, uh, sometimes the parents are willing to place it. Otherwise, they must just come back for us to place the nasogastric tube. And some people, uh, some uh, doctors even give erythromycin because it's a motility problem. And they will uh, always sometimes uh, even give Botox to see if that doesn't improve the problem and still not uh, give PPIs. Uh, if, if the gastrostomy tube, a, a nasogastric tube doesn't help, you can, give a, you can place an, a nasoduodenal tube uh, but that sort of tube, you can't send the patient down because they can't replace it. It's difficult to replace that tube. So you can keep the, the patient in hospital for an for a extended period of time. But uh, if, if it does not improve uh, with a, a nasoduodenal tube, uh, the patient can't go home with that tube. So maybe that, that patient eventually might need a nascent fundification. Um, yeah, what I want to say about the PPIs uh, in children, it's, it's, a, it's a, a problem with the infections. You can get pneumonia, you can get clostridium, you can get NEC uh, because of PPIs. So it's not a thing that you want to give it if it's not necessary. Uh, then if we can talk about the, the operation, uh, I think, you know, previous, previously before the whole thing wasn't worked out 100%, there was an increased uh, incidence of recurrence. But uh, these days, if you look at the uh, large series of uh, Stephen Rothenberg and all those people, then uh, there's no increase of, uh, of complications or recurrence of reflux if you do the laparoscopic procedure. So I think that, uh, that uh, laparoscopic method is, is the gold standard these days, so you have to op uh, offer that to the patient. It's the same as a gallbladder. There's actually no place these days for open cholecystectomy. So you must give the patient the option of, if you can't do uh, uh, laparoscopic surgery, you must give him the option of laparoscopic surgery. And then there, there are quite a few tricks with the, with the nursing. Uh, I just want to mention a few things that, that maybe will help. Uh, the one is minimal dissection. So, uh, we don't, uh, 
you know, we go around the esophagus, we mobilize it a little bit, but we don't go between the crew ray uh, and we don't damage the phrenoesophageal ligament. Mm. And then not everybody agree, but I think most agree that the, we can, you must take a vas previa because then you can make a better nissen. You can also better, uh, you know, identify the left cruise if you take the vas previa. And uh, yeah, the other thing is that uh, some people, uh, you can make the, the nissen, the, the, the rat too low. Obviously you must make it on top of the left gastric artery. But sometimes if, even if you do it there, the gap is, is too low. So your proximal stitch, the upper stitch, we do uh, put it through the stomach, we catch the, uh, the esophagus, and we uh, catch the, the right cruise eye up, and then we, we catch the, the other side of the stomach to fixate that uh, rat eye up, uh, so it's not too low. And uh, then there's also that you mustn't uh, pull in too much, uh, you must, uh, mustn't pull uh, too much fundus under the esophagus, and if you do the wrap, you mustn't, you must take the, on the right side, the area that you use for the wrap is the area where you uh, take, you've taken the vasa previa. And on the other side, you just take the edge there. You don't take too much uh, stomach to have a lot of uh, stomach anteriorly. And it's only two centimeter wrap. Usually it's two or three stitches. Um, yeah, that's, that's basically the story. So, uh, and then I also want to say in adults, we don't, uh, if you see a adult, uh, not an adult patient, a patient that's 10 years old with reflux, then the first thing you do is to, to put him on a PPI for four weeks. If he improves after four weeks, you can put him on eight weeks. And uh, after three months, you can stop it. And if he continues to have problem, then you can do some investigations. But uh, that's also like adults. Adults, we don't go and scope uh, directly or do special investigations. You try and see what they do on, on PPI. Um, so anybody that wants to ask a question is welcome. Yes, Martin, thank you very much. I think those are, are uh, you have emphasized uh, what is given in the books, most of the books, but you have also given uh, the practical uh, uh, hints and advice. Um, I have a, a few questions and I will start with my questions and then we will go one after the other yeah. consultants. Uh, so uh, I just have, have, uh, have a few comments uh, for Helga. Um, uh, Helga and others, we can do milk scan in East London. It can be done in the nuclear medicine department uh, in the East Coast radiology, but for the reasons which you said uh, to us, we don't do it often. And uh, secondly, uh, we haven't done a gastroesophageal disconnection since you arrived here. We had done a couple uh, a while ago and uh, Professor Lazarus in his private practice because he does so many fundoplications in general, and majority of them are neurologically impaired children, as exactly as Professor Fadikirk said, after two or at the most three uh, failed attempts, I mean, you do, it recurs, it causes problems, you do again, it causes problems again, then I know for sure in the last two or three years, he has done at least three or even more gastroesophageal disconnections. So that just, some information for you. Martin, um, uh, one more, um, just a comment. Um, those patients, you said yeah. infants, uh, you are able to send home with nasogastric tube. Are they majority, most of them, are they your private patients coming from good socioeconomic background? Because we, we never send uh, or dare to send our patients home with nasogastric tube. Yeah, yeah, all of them are private patients. Ah, yeah, so um, I think, that, that, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and they I must say, yeah. in first first uh, world countries, that's that's the norm to send the patient on with a nasogastric tube, actually. Yes. So they have good transport, everything. Yes. Uh, but usually the, the parents doesn't have a problem to, to place it. 
Yes. Can I no, just comment? No, can no, I just no, comment on the milk scan? I do don't do milk scans at all. Yes. If you, you if you go to the American or European Society of Gastroenterologists, both of them say it's a useless investigation. There's yes. no standardization. Uh, the, the, what you see on the milk scan doesn't correlate with it, uh, with your impedance study, you know, yes. that sort of thing. So we have it, but I, I never do it uh, because yes. it, it, uh, I don't believe in it. And then I just want to say about the esophagastric dissociation. Yes. For the right patient, it's a good operation. I just want to say the uh, immediate uh, complications yes. uh, is 17%. And one of the complications is leakage of uh, that anastomosis. Yes. Between the, and that's a serious problem. So patients yes. can die from that. Yes. And the long-term complications are also 70%, 17%. So you have a 35% uh, chance to have some sort of uh, problem after that operation. Mm. But I don't want to, to shoot it down that, uh, uh, you know, that it does, it's not necessary. And some patients, it is necessary. But no, it, it's got serious, can have serious complications. No, no, thank you, Martin. Thank you for clarifying about both things, the mill scan and the gastroesophageal disconnection. Um, if I may ask you, uh, what investigations do you currently do? I will give you two different scenarios. One is, let's say, um, a six-month-old baby or a nine-month-old infant with uh, gastroesophageal reflux which is not improving with medical, uh, supervised medical management. Uh, so would you do any investigation and what would it be? Yeah, well, the, what I will do a contrast study. Right. Uh, it doesn't help me that much, but because there's only a 4% gain with, as, the, as you said on the presentation hmm. and uh, uh, the problem is if you uh, of you when you place a patient like this to, uh, for long term on PPIs, then the gastroscopy is, isn't that accurate because you've treated already treated, uh, the yes. esophagitis with, with yes. medic, uh, medication. Yes. So uh, I'm I'm still doing in that patient. I will still go and do a gastroscopy. Yes. And uh, do a good gastroscopy and also take everywhere biopsies. And uh, if I want to, if I want to operate the patient, yes, then uh, then uh, I will definitely do impedance study or a pH study, yes, uh, just to have something on paper because what do you have history of the parents? The, the child can't give any history. Yes. Maybe you've kept the patient in hospital and see the vomiting situation, but I want something on paper because for medical legal reasons. Yes. So all my patients, I do impedance study, a pH impedance study, yes. just to have something on paper. Um, yes, I I know these days there's a sort of uh, a turn away from from pH studies and impedance studies. Most people don't think it's that important, uh, you know, in their decision making. But I, for me, it's still I, I use the I have the facility, so I, I do everything what I, which I can before I operate a child. No, no, thank you for clarifying that. Also, I fully agree with you that it is better to have. Um, uh, a, a proof for of some sort uh, because yeah. uh, for, for later use. And again, just information to Helga. Helga, we do not have access, you correctly said, but 24 hour pH study can be done in private hospital. And unfortunately, I mean, we can get uh, authorization and can get it done. So that's 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 that. Um, Martin, the next question will be, do you ever do open fund application now? And if yes, when? Um, yeah, the only, uh, only thing I can think, uh, look, I also want to say one of the important things is uh, for the laparoscopic thing is to accept the pain and everything. The pain is the big factor. The mm. other thing is this child can eat immediately. He doesn't mm. have a nice gastric tube and have Ileus for five days lying there in, in hospital. The next day is up and about, he's eating, you know, that sort of thing. Mm. So there's a vast difference if you compare the, the two patients the next day. Mm. You can immediately see which one had an open operation and which one uh, not. Mm. And uh, the other thing is maybe after I've 
uh, or uh, if somebody else has done two or three lessons or it was very difficult the laparoscopic one the previous time so sometimes if it's a redo i will do it open especially if i want to lengthen the esophagus if it was a tough repair and i think that's the problem the child the thing reoccurs then i will do the open operation yes but that's uh, the, that's almost uh, the only situation if the medical aides don't want to pay for the nursing, I refuse to do it. If they don't want to pay for the laparoscopic, I will never do it as a primary <laughs> procedure. <laughs> <That's> a, no, <laughs> no, thank you. And I remember a couple of years ago, uh, you you flew down here, and it was one of Dr. Lazarus's patient, uh, an yeah. obese adolescent boy, who already I think had two sort of failed uh, fundoplications. And between the two of you, both of you did your best, but because of lack of access, you had to convert to open operation. I remember that. Um, yeah, the thing is, that is an uh, ideal one that actually before the time, it also depends the previous time, if, if it was already difficult. Correct, yes. You would have expected uh, there's a problem. But yes. sometimes if you immediately go in with the, with the scope, you place the, 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 the scope port, and you see that it's one mass of, you can't see where the intestines are, you know, it's one, just yes. man, one mass of adhesions. Then yes. maybe it's better not to, to operate, uh, uh, to go on laparoscopic, laparoscopic, because you can give it a try, but yes. you will quickly see what the situation is, if you can continue or not. Yes, I think you did the same in that patient, I remember, in about 15 minutes, both of you decided, no, it's futile, and uh, mm -hmm. then, then you opened the procedure. Uh, my last yeah, I, button, I, can, yeah. I can remember the open one was also difficult we nearly yes. called you for help <laughs> yes yes no, no. i was there and i was i was the retractor so i distinctly remember yeah. that no no thank you my last but one question to you is do you always do a nissen fundoplication if you are asked to do a feeding gastrostomy in a neurologically impaired child yeah, that's a very good question and uh, firstly, if it's a neurologically impaired child, I, I do a few investigations. I yes. do a, that's one of the, if I don't know if there's reflux or not, the child needs, probably needs a gastrostomy, but we're not sure about the nissen. Then I will make sure, I'll try to make sure with the special investigations if there's a reflux or not. Yes. So in them, I do a gastroscopy, I do impedance study. Yes. The whole thing to see if this child has reflux. Yes. Um, because it can, uh, sometimes if, if you do unnecessary nissen, that child can have more problems post-surgery, uh, you know, if he, if he doesn't need, because you have a tight wrap there and the child now struggled more with, with saliva and things like that. So yes. I think most people these days agree, don't do a nissen if it's not necessary. And what yes. I also want to say it in that patient, I also do a contrast study to see if there's aspiration from the pharynx uh, area into the lungs or, and how the swallowing is, just to give us an indication of what is going on there. Uh, yes. Yeah, so that's, that's a story. And if I only do uh, a gastrostomy, yes. I do it on the greater curvature, uh, quite low down, so yes. that it doesn't interfere with, uh, with a, a nissen in the future. Yes. I have such a patient that I'm going to do on Monday where the gastrostomy tube was very high placed. So yes. it's impossible. So I have to take down that gastrostomy now, the whole thing, yes. uh, which is not nice. And then, you know, re uh, place a new, new gastros gastrostomy tube as well. Yes. Yeah, and yes. That, the other thing that they say, say is that, uh, uh, I don't know how it works, but they say you can use blended food through the uh, gastrostomy tube after the age of one year. So that uh, apparently also help uh, with reflux, that it's not a problem in the future. It helps yes. a little bit with that. And, and also with the retching, apparently that might help. Uh, yeah, the, the, the contrast study is also to look at the emptying of the stomach and, and yes. things like that. So yes. I do all the investigations. Yes. The other thing that, that is sometimes difficult is if you have neurologically impaired children, small ones, and you have to do, uh, you can't, you know, they probably have reflux, but you can't prove it, but they definitely need a gastrostomy tube. Okay, so yes. if you have a three or four kilogram child already with the gastrostomy tube, uh, 
Martin, sorry, there is some problem with your sound. Hello, Martin. Hello, Martin. It's so uh, I make sure it's the bullet But if at that stage, yeah. hello. Esophagitis and treat on those places. And it's um, some centers recommend that you use the PPIs because, as you're saying, that improved esophagitis because of the PPI. So some people recommend you stop it for a short period of time, do your scope, and reassess and see from there. Um, I think what's also important as well, um, why I think Prof. Um, Chitness, who um, decided to ask you every single question which I was going to ask, um, what's important is to um, see especially the operative operative side because what happens is that we have situations where it's a four or five month old with failure to thrive with recurrent um, chest infections who um, at that point in time has a gap where we can actually try to do an, uh, any form of rep but we find that um, from the anesthetic point of view it might not be safe um, because they also worry that the increased pneumoperitoneum might cause splinting, might affect um, respiration intraop or ventilation intraop. So um, to try and actually eliminate that factor, we have a tendency of kind of being uh, coerced, if that's a nice way of saying it, into doing more open uh, fund applications. But this is more limited in the very the inf in the infantile um, group, not the more big guy kids. Um, with my s s very limited experience, um, particularly with um, esophagastric dissociation, um, because I've had the pleasure of actually assisting uh, Prof. Lazarus in private with some of these cases. Um, we find that with the kids that um, we've done, the outcome has been surprisingly good because um, the, the whole notion of you connecting the esophagus straight into the jejunum, so there's rapid clearance so there's no halt there's no risk per se of of aspiration there but obviously we have to do with other factors such as dumping which can be a problem um so i i, I like the the procedure um definitely it can be used but with a very very select um patient neurologically impaired with um failed nissens i think those um are the ideal ones um the only question Prof, uh, Prof. that I can maybe address to you is when we when you have a child post uh, esophageal atresia um, that we repaired and um, has uh, strictures which we dilate um, what's the next step are we worried that the stricture is purely from the anastomosis that we did or the element of reflux which we kind of expect post um, repair and so which one would you think? Just dilate and treat it as, a, as an uh, anastomotic stricture, or would we consider that it's a reflux stricture that we will dilate initially, then do a wrap? Um, basically, how soon do you think we, it's ideal to do the wrap? And should we try to do it via the abdominal route or thoracoscopically, if feasible? Yeah. 
the thing is, uh, 50 fifty percent of uh, esophagus atresia patients have uh, pathological reflux, but uh, most of them, from my side, you can treat medically, and and they improve. Uh, if sometimes you have a patient with a, di a difficult anastomosis, which you within the first month or so you see that there's a problem and he needs a few dilatations, I won't be uh, that worried. But if he doesn't improve or a late presentation uh, presentation of the stricture, then uh, I will with a dilatation I I will do a, a biopsy. We'll do the scope and do a biopsy. I sometimes do a contrast study to see what the situation is, and I can. We can sometimes do impedance studies. So I, I investigate the child uh, for those that doesn't doesn't improve, or or if it's a sort of uh, stricture that I thought is not going to happen with that child, and we struggle with his stricture. Okay, um, thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, since Prof is and still can I make a comment? Yes, please. Dr. Preston, can I make a comment? Uh, first one is about the contrast study. In all our neurologically impaired patients at Stipico Hospital, we would do a video by the speech therapist who's present there and recorded properly and not just only in the radiology department and ordinary swallow and, and see how the stomach empties. We do a, a proper video swallow and you've got that on record. And that also sometimes would tell us if there's reflux or not. But I mean, that's not the most important reason. The reason is that we can then, the speech therapist can clearly evaluate exactly the swallowing process. And we've got it on video, so you can look at it afterwards. I think that that works well for us. And then just to touch on what you've just said now when you started your discussion is, I think if it's clearly a surgical patient, then we can do all these discussions that we're doing now. But the, the, the issue is, as you've said, what about this between three and six months old child that referred to you by a... Um, yeah, it seems that this, she's off. That you know how to evaluate. Is this regurgitation, is this reflux, or is it reflux disease? Um, because you're going to see some of those patients in the pediatric surgery department. They don't come saying this is a clear-cut one for, for you just to evaluate when to do the surgery. I think that's quite important. Yeah, I can also say that uh, I want to come back to that uh, contrast study. Uh, I use a, a contrast study also in neurologically impaired children. If they, uh, you know, as a previous uh, gastrostomy and we're not sure about the, the reflux, then I put a lot of contrast like a, a milk feed through the gastrostomy tube and, and look for reflux. Uh, for, that for me is an important uh, test. And also if I do re, redo surgery, I want to see exactly some of them as translocation of transmigration of the stomach. I want exactly to see how much stomach there is in the chest, what exactly is going on there. I want to look at uh, the emptying of the stomach. And uh, we all have seen patients that had a malrotation and end up with a nascent fund application. So I do all those tests because of medical legal things as well, which is rife at this, at, at this moment. All right, thanks, Bob. Um, maybe we can give the other consultants opportunity to speak. Um, Yashoda, yeah. you have your five cents to add. Uh, hi, everyone. Yes, uh, thanks, hello. And thanks, Dr. Bandikar, for joining us. Um, I just wanted to ask about, I, more specifically to Helga, if she came across the transient lower, lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. Hello, have you already asked her about that? <laughs> I, I actually did, and I... I, I, I got that yeah, so I didn't, I, Oh, no, I didn't ask her about that now. I didn't want to make, give her unnecessary headache. Um, but okay. maybe she can kind of uh, tell us what she thinks about yeah, that. It, it clarifies why the child gets reflux. 
and why the, the infants get reflux. So maybe she can just comment on it quickly. The only part I've come across is that the infants have a lower tone of the lower esophageal sphincter. So it relaxes more frequently and for longer than it does in older children and adults. And therefore they're at higher risk for reflux frequently. Yeah, it's actually that they have longer periods of that relaxation, um, but the tone is actually normal. So it's still under investigation, but it's good to know why they're having the reflux and what's the, what's the mechanism yeah. behind it. Can, because I that comment, can I comment on that? Sure. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, normally if you swallow within two seconds, you have relaxation of that lower sphincter. Yeah. So uh, if there's in coordination of that, or if there are more of these relaxations without swallowing, not associated with swallowing, uh, uh, if that is increased, then uh, while it's an important factor, that's why they use also this baclovan as a treatment because that uh, has an effect on, on those, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, relaxations. And also it was showed that if the child lies on his right side, you get more of those relaxation periods. That's why some of the conservative management people say you must lift the head up and the child must lie on his left side. That also mm. helps. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Yashoda, go ahead. Um, more questions, okay. comments? Yeah. Yeah. And then I didn't get uh, very clearly the indications for surgery. I think that needs to be cleared up well because the, the one that I was listening for but I didn't hear was the acute life-threatening episodes and the apneas in the infant because that for me would be one of the emergency indications if we think it's reflux that's causing it. I did mention, not the apnea one, but I did mention the acute life-threatening events. Okay, sorry. I'm trying to get there again. Um, no, then, that's fine. Um, I, I, maybe I missed it. But yeah, that's one of the, 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 the you know, hard indications. And then the complications, obviously, after the reflux. So the recurrent esophagitis, barrets, and um, strictures. Yes. We have a patient recently who has a stricture that we will do an Anderson for. So I just didn't hear that exactly, but uh, that's fine. I know um, it's probably just an omission. Yeah, uh, you, then, Dr. Jack, can I ask yeah, you something? Yeah, can I ask you first? I, I think yeah. apnea and uh, apparent life-threatening events, there might be association, but it's not proven. If you look at all the yeah. things, if, if, you you ask the, if you ask the pediatric gastroenterologist, they will say it's not the case. I, I've operated one or two with apparent yeah. life-threatening events. Mm -hmm. For me, I, I don't even, I don't see that patients, uh, I don't see that many of those patients. And I'm not, uh, maybe there is an association, but it's not a very strong one. And it's not, the, okay. it's not worked out. I think it's probably more our neurologically impaired neonates and infants that we get that. But yeah. we do do them for that and it does I think it does help in those cases. Can I, can I, can I uh, ask, tell the registrars, there's a textbook, esophageal and gastric disorders in infancy and childhood from all the yes. talk. That's an excellent textbook. You can read about apnea, you can read a, a, a apparent life-threatening events, the whole thing. There's a chapter on every, every one of those aspects. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, then can I ask you about technical stuff about the operation? Yep. Just because I'm still starting out, so I'm still refining my technique. So I just wanted to ask, how do you retract the liver? Do you use a Nathanson retractor? No, I've, I have that. Uh, I use a snake retractor. It's one that uh, that you can bend. Uh, there are two sizes. So I put I place a port on the lateral side of the abdomen and then put the, the retractor under the left lobe of the liver. Some, some people only use a, a grasper and just grab the diaphragm under the liver. Yeah. And uh, there's also a, a thing that uh, 
if you do single incision, listen from the applications, we've, we've done a few, then the liver is a problem. And they oh. use glue to stick the left lobe of the liver to the anterior abdominal wall. And then they, they work like that. So glue was used and that, those people that just the idea to use glues, glue, uh, is received a very a big uh, prize for that order, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the other thing, yeah, the other thing I want to tell you, I haven't seen the thing, but uh, if you have a small baby, some people, I also don't actually see why it's necessary to, to close the crure in a small baby. Mm. It's normal anatomy, you haven't worked there, why bother there and put in a few stitches? Yeah. So no, I, I've, done it, I've done it a few times. And I was actually stupid not to, to publish it, but there's now a paper out about that. And I also firmly believe in that. It's not necessary every time to work there. Stay out of the guru, mm, right? But okay. uh, especially in small babies, I think, it, I think it's not necessary. Mm, mm. Yeah, so I'd, I normally don't, but when there's obviously a, a, a hiatus hernia, which I had recently, then I had to close it. But normally I wouldn't, I do a minimal dissection and I avoid mm -hmm. um, that area. Uh, the other thing was, so the snake retractor, we'll, we'll, have a, have, we'll try to look for that. It's, it's often the rate limiting factor in my operation is getting the liver out of the way. But we are working on getting a Nathanson retractor. I, uh, what I did is I, I've used one Nathanson, Nathanson uh, retractor. I've showed it to somebody and they made me a dozen of them in different sizes. So I have, I have a dozen of those, but I actually don't use them. I, I, I prefer the snake retractor. So you can actually okay. make your own ones. No, if, if I can sizes. just add, uh, Colin got uh, a set of, uh, we call it Amalinda retractor, because Amalinda is the suburb where our Frere Hospital is uh, located. And uh, he has donated mm -hmm. one set to us. and. Um, uh, we are planning to procure the frame uh, so that we can attach those uh, retractors. But I think, Yashoda, it will be a good idea to get details of the snake retractor from uh, Prof. Martin. And uh, we can always look yeah. at that. We don't have to go uh, with the Amalinda retractor. So that's, that's a nice option we can look at. Okay, go ahead. Any other questions, okay. comments, Yashoda? And then the other one, one quick question, one last question, quick question, is if you always take down the short gastric vessel. Um, yeah, I, I do that. Uh, but I don't have a problem with the people that don't do it. Mm. Uh, as I've said, I think I can do a, a more floppy nissen. Mm. I can uh, do a better nissen without uh, rotation, abnormal rotation uh, of, the, of, the, of the stomach. And I see the left cruise much better if I clear it and, and has taken the you know vas previa away. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you very but much. The other yeah. thing is I also still use dilators, uh, mm. bougies to mm, do my okay. lessons, except mm. for the small ones. The small babies I sometimes I don't do it. And for the neurologically impaired children I also don't use it because if they can't swallow I actually want a more tight uh, mm. nissen with more stitches. Yeah, I don't want about uh, uh, a floppiness, and I actually don't want a floppiness. Yeah, yeah. And do, you, do sorry, one last question: Do you always do a nissen? You don't do any of the other wraps. No. So either floppy or a tight nissen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, th thank you. Right, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, I would like. Uh, uh, sorry, I got interrupted in between. My internet just dipped down. But I'm glad Dr. Machaya took over. Uh, so Martin, we have heard from Dr. Machaya, uh, Dr. Manik Chan, who is the other consultant. And I would like to then invite uh, Dr. Majola, who is our third consultant. And all three of them are quite skilled in doing laparoscopic fundal application. So Dr. Majola, please make your comments, ask questions. Sorry. Okay, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now I was just saying, um, good evening, everyone. Thanks, Prof, for the uh, 
the input and also sharing your knowledge. I don't have any questions or comments because uh, I think everyone else has covered most of the things that I had wanted to ask Prof. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tuleleko. Uh, just one, one um, comment to Dr. Marie Kirsten's uh, information. Uh, yes, Marie, we also uh, involve a speech therapist. So in fact, when uh, a fund apply, uh, when a, a swallow, contrast swallow is being done in the radiology department, one of our doctors and a speech therapist, we both accompany the patient there. Unfortunately, my knowledge, we don't have a video facility, but maybe I need to ask the radiology department. And um, so we, we also do the same to understand the swallowing mechanism of these children, especially ones with, um, with uh, neurological impairment. Uh, Martin, I've got one more question for you. Um, do you see more complications in neurologically impaired children? Uh, yeah, the only complication I see is that uh, the, I think there is a higher than, uh, incidence of recurrence. Uh, yes. That's all. For the rest, there's not a problem. Yes. Not at all. Okay. Um, can I also say uh, the, uh, I, the sealing devices that we use, uh, we started off with Ligasure. I still like the Ligasure. Yes. But if it's a small baby, we can use the Stores Roby. It's a... Uh, that's a, a possibility that you can use. And then these days, I've, uh, the Just Right Sealer uh, is also available. It's quite expensive, but it's a, a wonderful instrument for the section, for, for working in the, in the uh, for doing and so expensive, but I think that's a very, very nice thing. It's a three millimeter sealer from Just Right, um, and uh, it works wonderful. Uh, sorry, Martin, I didn't catch um, exactly what I, is the stores instrument you said? It's a Roby, it's a reticulating uh, the sector bipolar that you okay. get from stores. It's okay. not that nice because you can only work on the tip, but right. Uh, the just right instrument is fantastic. Uh, so, is it just it's right? Expensive. Is it the name of the company? Yeah, it's that company of Steven Rothenberg, but they're in, in the country now. Uh, if you want information, I can send you. We've, we've tried out. They also have a five millimeter stapler, but quite expensive, 24,000 Rand for, for that stapler. Oh dear, okay. Uh, but you know what uh, I, to, I, I, sometimes use, I sometimes use it for the imperforated anus patients. Right. To, to uh, you, know, you know, just staple the, the fistula through. Very yes. nice. Yes, yes. You know what I'm if, going to do? If, if yeah. anybody wants to go and see a nice, a nice lesson, just go on the internet, uh, uh, type this, Steven Rothenberg, just mm -hmm. write Nissen, Nissen fund application. He's, got a, he's done a few other operations that's on the internet. But if yes. you want to see a nice lesson on a small baby, have a look there. Wonderful. Thank you, Martin. You know what I'm going to do, Martin? I'm going to uh, share your contact details with uh, Dr. Yashoda Manikchan, and she will contact you about uh, all these uh, instruments and things yep. which I'm hearing for the first time, and you can advise her, and then we can, we can uh, yeah. get their quotations and all those things. And um, one more question, sort of comment. Uh, isn't higher failure rate inversely proportional to the experience of the surgeon. So as, as you go, um, as you do more and more of them, um, don't, doesn't your uh, failure rate go down? Hello? Hello? Um, yeah, there's definitely a factor, but Anybody can do a lesson. So, but I think you need uh, at least 15. Previously, they said 30 lessons. Huh. But I think these days they talk about one, five, 15 lessons. Yes. But not on your own, with somebody that knows how to do the operation. Yes, yes. No, that's, that's... So it's not that difficult. Yes, yes. No, thank you, Martin. Uh, Helga, you did the presentation. So I do just... you have...
Just one, Mike, one, one comment. Please, please. Please go ahead. If you, if, you do, if you do the dissection of the esophagus, never go on the outside of the right cruise, especially in the superior part. I've, I've once uh, injured one of those uh, hepatic veins there. Yes. And that's not a nice uh, uh, a complication to have. So stay away. Yes. Stay on yes. the cruise. Yes. And that's a story, especially superior. You, you won't believe how close those things are to the, to the esophagus. Yes. I think the smaller the baby, the closer these things are to the esophagus and to the crury. Now, Martin, uh, if I can just summarize, I think you have highlighted adequate investigations and proper documentation of investigations and everything before uh, making a decision uh, to do a fundoplication. Because if uh, I'm correct to say the word, it's an unphysiological operation and especially in neurologically impaired children. And uh, you have yes. time and again emphasized the, the minimal dissection. So don't overdo it. Do what is absolutely minimum. Um, and, and I think you can, you can summarize, you can say, say the last word. Hello? Hello, uh, yeah, you're off yeah. now, but I can hear you again. Uh, sorry, yes, sorry. Now, I think you, uh, you summarize, you emphasize it very well. Adequate investigations and documentations before doing a Nissan fund application, especially in neurologically impaired children, and at the time of operation, minimal dissection. So, so yes. uh, anything else you want to, to add on? Um, I think then we can end the meeting. Yeah, no, I'm happy with everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, maybe I must just caution everybody that uh, for medical reasons, medical legal reasons, make sure that you have the right indication for the operation because mm -hmm. it's sort of a, a child that's not uh, sick, that you, it's just got a reflux, you know. Mm -hmm. So to have a major complication or a death mm -hmm. is totally unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they investigate is why did you do the operation? Mm -hmm. Mm. Really, okay. that's important. Yeah. I'm now busy with a court case. It's the same yeah. situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think most of us uh, would have heard and read about this tragic case. Uh, so I think that's really the final, final, uh, uh, very, very practical and useful advice. So I think if there are no more questions, uh, I would really uh, profusely thank Professor Furnikirk again, uh, Dr. Mary Kirsten. All our consultants, Dr. Machaya, Manik Chan, uh, Majola, and especially Dr. Nahaus for uh, doing a nice presentation and inviting uh, such nice discussion and teaching and comments. So thank you, everyone. Martin, all the best. Hope to yeah, see you. Thank in you for inviting me. I, I've enjoyed it a lot. And uh, in the future, if you need me for something, I'm more than willing to, to, to join you. No, we will call you. Uh, we will call you for <laughs> anything and everything laparoscopic. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Melon. Have a yes. nice evening. Thank you, Marie. Bye-bye. Yeah. All the Bye -bye, best. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Nice Thank meeting you. you. Listen to you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Uh, thank you. Bye-bye.